Being tactical to me means more than guns, more than knives, fatigues, or your favorite bullet caliber. I want to be more strategic in all facets of my life. Whether that means being more strategic and methodical in my everyday life, and my everyday work, or being more committed to my workout. Hello guys, and welcome to a live broadcast, a live interview. It's our first one that we're doing. We're gonna be doing a lot of these types of interviews on Remote Tactical, and if you're interested to see more or have any ideas of what you'd like to see, leave a comment down below. Always leave a thumbs up, of course. That helps us uh, stay motivated to make these videos. And today I wanna make an introduction to one of my good friends on an American homestead. His name is Zach. Hello, Zach, say hello to the audience. Hey everybody, how are you doing? Glad to have you guys on the channel today. We're really happy to be interviewing you guys today because what I'm trying to do with this channel is get people to understand that tactical is more than about guns and knives. I love to share my, my tips and uh, tools of the trade when it comes to guns and knives, and I love to see other people's reviews, but I, I strongly believe that being tactical goes outside of the military mindset of, of tactical thinking. So we're gonna get into that today, but first I want everyone to know who Zach is and what he's doing on an American homestead. So Zach, would you mind telling us a little bit about your homestead and what you're doing out there? Yeah, sure. So our website is called anamericanhomestead.com and uh, we've been doing this now for about three years and uh, we live off grid. Uh, you're seeing me right now powered through a DSL line that runs up our mountain and it's all powered by solar. So we do have a DSL line. Uh, off grid technically means off the electrical grid. So we are off the electrical grid. We don't have water, sewer, electricity here. Um, the electricity, this whole thing is being powered on my end by solar panels. And so uh, we've been doing this now for three years. We grow our own food, um, raise our own uh, meat. Uh, we have chickens and turkeys. We've had sheep in the past um, and uh, maybe transitioning to, to cattle at some point. But yeah, we're, we look, we're an off-grid family. Uh, there's me and my wife and our two children. And uh, my in-laws also live with us on the homestead. They have their own house. And uh, that's what an American homestead is all about. And we just show people and educate them on how, what it really means to actually go out to the middle of the woods and just carve out your own existence and 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 we learn learn lots of things along the way because you learn by doing and so we're having a good time with that people really enjoy the channel and uh, the website and so that's kind of what we're about and you're currently on your second season or you're working on your third season for the YouTube channel is that correct Right, right. So we, we do videos all throughout the year, but we uh, during the summertime when really things get busy here because you have planting that happens in the spring, we're getting ready to go into that season now, and then you have just an amazing amount of work that happens during the summer and going into the fall with the harvest and making sure you get all the produce and all the stuff you've been raising into your stores. And so um, we start a season of episodes during that time frame, and so we're getting ready to start season three this coming uh, late spring. Excellent. And if you guys want to subscribe, go ahead and click on the information bubble that's uh, somewhere up here on your YouTube player right now. Um, we'd love for you guys to check out their channel and subscribe. Obviously, we're going to be talking a little bit more about what they do on today's interview, um, but please go check them out. Subscribe and AmericanHomestead.com as well. So, Zach, tell me what it was like for you personally and your family to transition from an urban lifestyle, living like I do now in a major city where you have traffic, where you live in an electrical powered home and then transitioning that lifestyle into what you do now into a homestead off grid, no running water, no electricity. Yeah. I mean, here's the deal. This is something that, that can make this easier for people. And we get a lot of emails uh, every week from people who really want to live this lifestyle or people who realize they can't, but they really like enjoying uh, the shows and the, the videos we put out and the articles that we put out on the website. So uh, here's, here's what it's like. I mean, if you want a homestead, if people want a homestead and you want to know the experience of transitioning, like you say, uh, from the city into you know the country, you have to start homesteading before you homestead. And that's as simple as that, you know, and, and there's a number of recommendations. I tell people, you got to start cooking, you know, stop going out to the restaurant, stop doing, you know, start cooking on your own, start, start having a garden. Even if you have a tomato plant outside in your back 
porch on in your apartment. I mean, have a tomato plant, just learn what it takes to make that plant grow. You'll learn so much just by doing that. So what we did for a number of years to make this transition is easier, even though it was still difficult, we basically started homesteading uh, before we started homesteading. And, and it's just, it's just a, it's, there's so much experience and learning that goes on during that process. And so uh, people who are interested in the transition and what that's like, um, it's hard. It's very hard, and um, it takes some time getting used to. But here's the deal. Uh, it was that or sit in traffic uh, for an hour each way to work, you know, every day. And having – seeing all the influences of just unbelievable nonsense – you know, being inundated into my brain and my family's brain and all the distractions of the world and really getting, not getting the satisfaction of growing my own food, you know, you know, living life on my own terms and, and having that satisfaction, you know, what was my choices? I'm like, I'm not going to do this anymore. So uh, that's what we decided to do. Uh, and, and we knew it was going to be hard and it has been hard and trying. And so we've, uh, but we've, you know, we've done, we, we had that passion and we had that determination to succeed and we're still going. So what would you say was the moment that really shifted your urban lifestyle to the wanting to transition into this? What was what was that catalyst that got you interested in the homesteading lifestyle and what process did you take to start learning? You say homestead before you homestead. Was it a process of reading books? Was it you watching other people on YouTube uh, do their homesteading uh, videos and how to's or, you know, like you said, planting a small garden or taking care of backyard chickens? I mean, to be honest with you, what really prompted me to get started, I mean, to look at this, it was just freedom. I mean, liberty and, and the desire to go to, to have that. And, and, you know, people who live in the city, you realize that there are so many regulations and so many things that you have to adhere to today that it's ridiculous. You have no freedom. You have no liberty. And they're taking it little by little from you. And um, where can I move? in these United States where I can have as much freedom as possible and have as much – as least amount of regulation as possible and live the life that I want to live. Um, and so that's kind of what made us start looking. Uh, we started, um, you know, just – you know, figuring out you know where that was possible and how how that would look and um, and so that that's really what prompted us to look into this lifestyle as being something we wanted to do. So when you say freedom, I'm, I'm hearkening back to financial freedom. When I think of freedom in the sense of how Dave Ramsey describes being financially independent, would you say that the number one thing before you get homesteading? Uh, in your in your veins is to be debt free, or is there a way for someone who is you know struggling with that transition, who is still in debt to the system, to also be a homesteader? What what would you uh, advise yeah, on that? See that, and that's usually that, yeah, that's usually one of the biggest um, questions we get on a regular basis. And the, yeah, you it's better to be debt free, obviously, but most of America is not. I mean, most everyone in your audience probably is not debt free, and so. Uh, Here's the deal, folks. Do what you can. Do anything you can, anything possible to get out of debt. And, and I mean, broad spectrum. I mean, leave all options on the table. Get out of debt. Um, there's certain debt that's harder to get out of than others. Um, uh, and, and even so much, uh, just to give you a little bit of our background, we even declared bankruptcy along the way because we – it was a way to use the system to get out of the system. And we had not a whole lot of possessions. We sold off most of our stuff to pay off our debt. We hadn't been using our credit cards for a number of years anyway. But we were so imprisoned by the interest and the way the system is meant to keep you chained to it that uh, we went to go see a lawyer. And he looked at us and he was like, yeah, you guys are what we call judgment proof. And uh, we went through the bankruptcy process. And I got rid of all of my debt except for um, uh, my school loans, which I still have to pay off. But uh, other than that, I mean, that really released us from a lot of responsibility that the system was tying you to. And it's not that I was just trying to get out of my, you know, my responsibility of paying back a debt. The lawyer looked at it and said, hey, man, you've been paying off your credit cards for years. You haven't been using them. You know, you're, you're, right now you're just paying off the interest. And, and that's how the system keeps you as a slave is the interest and, and things like that. And, so, and then to try to get, get you to spend more and more money, which we, we had already figured that game out a long time ago. So, I mean, guys, listen, you got to get out of debt. If you want to do something like this, um, look for financial independence. Look for financial freedom. Dave Ramsey has a lot of good stuff out there. Um, not that I agree with everything he says, but uh, that stuff is important. 
and, and yeah, it's, it's, it needs to be paramount if you're looking to go down this road. So one of the big things that living in a city almost guarantees you is hearing sirens. And even, you know, case in point last night, uh, I wouldn't say we live in the worst neighborhood or the best. We're middle class. We live somewhere in between. And just last night, there was a police helicopter over my backyard, uh, spotlight and everything. And I mean, granted, it was it was a couple hundred feet away at, at a gas station in the hospital down the street. But I could feel the the rotors over my over my house um, as they would do the circling path. So that's something about living in an urban life that is just not something that I want my children to be exposed to. And I imagine that's something that you don't want your children exposed to and, and why you moved out to a homestead. What what would you say is the biggest difference in being tactically minded when it comes to living on a homestead versus living in a city environment? Right. You know, and here's the deal. My antenna are always, uh, I was, I was in the military, I was in the infantry. And so when you go through that training and that mindset, you're always, your antenna are always up the rest of your life. And so I'm trying, I try, I'm very observant on what goes on in my surroundings, but you know what, when being that observant about what's going on in my surroundings, living in the city or in a suburban environment or urban environment <clears throat> it um it really drives you crazy i mean you have to be aware seriously 110 percent of the time not that i'm not aware at other times but you know and i have to think about my children and, and their safety and all the things that can go wrong because listen man we live in a messed up world i mean this world is messed up every time you turn on the news you hear about crazy stupid stuff that's going on and um, you know I, I wanted to have my kids have the same experiences growing up that I did I grew up outside of a city called st. Louis and um, but I remember you know growing up you know I could walk down the street with my BB gun with my friends and, and all of our BB guns you know and and go go plank in you know in their backyard at cans or whatever um, I could do that today. There's no way you're gonna walk down a suburban neighborhood with a bunch of bunch of kids with BB guns. You know, well, I mean, rifles and stuff. And you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get the cops called on you. And you know, there's no way you can you can trust your children to go out and run around in the neighborhood and or go run around in the woods somewhere because most suburban or urban places that have any woods, I mean, it's just that bad stuff happens. And so. Uh, you know, I wanted to have my, my children to have that sort of lifestyle and that freedom and liberty growing up that I had because it really develops the character of a person. And um, today, kids don't have that. They sit in front of the video games all day. They sit in front of the TV all day. And they just don't have that, you know, that fun time. They said, I saw a newspaper article the other day, Sal, where they said that prison inmates today are getting more outside time than children in elementary school, you know, because they have recesses in prisons. You know, they have their, you know, yard times. And they're getting more outside time than kids today. That's sad, you know. And so that that was, yeah. So that was one of my big things of you know let's let's give my kids. I don't like where this is going. Let's give my kids more of a lifestyle how I grew up with. So you have younger children, and you know you have your father-in-law and, and your wife and and your mother-in-law with you. What are some of the day-to-day -day things that you guys do to stay prepared? I mean. As a homesteader, you're, you're naturally categorized as someone who is a prepper or a survivalist. But what are some of the things that you do to stay up on your, on your training with your, with your weapons and also on your security and your, your surroundings? Right. So I live out in the middle of nowhere right now. I mean, I'm really out there. You go to nowhere, you go 30 minutes more, and then you're in the middle of it. So I'm in the middle of nowhere. So, I mean, no one's showing up on my mountain unless you're either lost or, you know, you're, you know, you're a visitor and you're a friend of mine. So, um, uh, you know, I don't have to worry so much about being technically minded for two legged predators. However, we do have mountain lions out here. We have bears. And so I do carry a pistol every day. Uh, I carry a Glock. Um, and so, um, the Glock I, I have, uh, I do train with it. There are plenty of times I get up in the morning and I practice drawing my weapon. Um, I've been through some advanced training courses. I was a certified firearms instructor in the state of Missouri for a number of years. Um, uh, participated in a lot of firearms training throughout my life. Um, so um, I do do my own training, you know, here and there sometimes. And uh, at some point, I'll get a shooting range on here. But my wife is also very well, very well trained with her weapon. And um, so, but yeah, I mean, day to day, you know, we we keep an open eye. Like rattlesnakes are a big thing around here, and we have young kids running around, and uh, that's something you have to keep an eye out for. And so we are tactically ready when that happens. If, and there's a number of rattlesnakes that we shoot every year, 
So, you know, she's out there doing her laundry on a day-to-day -day basis. She does her laundry by hand. Um, we have a wash station or we're out there um, uh, gathering water or you know, working in the garden and there are snakes that we come across. And so, you know, we're always mindful of that. And the children have been trained to be mindful of that. So uh, we just did a video on my, on my channel about the, the snake bite kit that we keep uh, on hand if we need it, um, that we would use, utilize on the way to emergency uh, personnel if we needed to, to do that. So as we're talking about the weapons that you're carrying right now, um, one of the biggest things that you see on YouTube right now on when it comes to these types of channels is what is your everyday carry? And you showed us your Glock. Um, if you were to dump out your pockets right now outside of your Glock, what else do you keep around you at all times on your homestead that, uh, you know, keep you tactical, keep you frosty as far as like a snake bite? You know, is, is that something that you actually would take out your, your Glock to suppress the danger of a rattlesnake? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my first round in my Glock is, I'll show it to you, this is, right here. This is a snake shot. I don't know if you can see that. But the first round in my Glock is 9 millimeter snake shot. And so that can round, I, mean, I go through a number of them. Well, it basically it's a shotgun for a 9 millimeter. Okay. Turns your, turns your 9 millimeter Glock into a, a shotgun. And so I, I use a number of these every year just to dispatch rattlesnakes or copperheads that are in the garden or wherever. Um, so, uh, uh, but, um, I, in my pockets, I usually keep a lighter. I usually keep a pocket knife. There's my, uh, Gerber pocket knife that I keep. Um, uh, a lot of times I'll have a headlamp or a flashlight with me for, uh, you know, different times. Cause it, you know, when it gets dark, we always have a flashlight on you, but, but, um, I mean, there's all kinds of things we keep, you know, Around the around the, on our persons or around close by if we need it. Medical kits, uh, advanced trauma kits, things like that. If something catastrophic would happen, that's within a very good, easy to get place if me and my wife needed to, needed to access that too as well. Great. So one of the things that you learn in the military, and and I, I share that experience with you, is the motto of staying alert and staying alive. What what does tactical mean to you? If I was not in the military, how would you explain that the tactical mindset? Oh, it's hard to explain for someone who's never been in the military, or um, because you know it's it's just that mentality. If you haven't been raised with that mentality to stay alert, stay alive, to be observant of your of your surroundings, uh, explain that to someone who just you know they're only. I mean, it's just, it's just, that'd be, it's, it's hard, you know, um, to explain that sort of thing. It's like the people have heard of that analogy with the sheep and the sheep dogs. Um, it's hard to explain to a sheep why it's important to be a sheep dog. You know, you just, can't, it's right. very hard to do that. <laughs> so one of the, one of the goals for my channel is to talk about working from home and the business ventures that you know someone who works from home does as be it an entrepreneur or someone who works for a company walk me through your day-to-day -day process outside of the homesteading lifestyle what is it that you do to keep your bread on the table exactly and uh, staying tactical in that being efficient in your day-to-day -day? walk me through a 24-hour day on the homestead right so um uh, basically, I'm a web designer by background. I'm a web graphic artist. I, I produce printed materials, collateral materials for companies, uh, branding, things like that. So uh, I still do that. I still have a, a number of clients. Sometimes I work with and do do that thing, do that kind of stuff for. But uh, what we've tried to do more so here on the homestead is build a business. That's what an American homestead is all about, where we educate people. We get money from advertising for some of those articles and videos that we put out on YouTube and on the website. And then we also sell products, homestead products. Uh, uh, some of the th things you, we sent you, a few of those so that you could take a look at them. Um, but uh, we, they seem to be doing really well. People are very interested in that. Um, but also, we're just I just... Uh, plowed up a quarter acre of, of one of our pastures and we're getting ready to plant a cash crop of sorghum this year where we will produce molasses and sorghum syrup and uh, very sweet very tasty and so we're going to sell that as well on our website um, you know just things like that also Jerusalem artichokes is something that we're going to be selling sunchokes uh, people have a real uh, uh, interest in those as a vegetable and root crop and so we're going to be selling those as well uh, as a cash crop in, in years down the road so um because we're, we're kind of building that up takes time 
But so, yeah, there's lots of things that you can do as a homesteader to earn a living. And you're not going to be rich. You're not doing it for the money. You're, you're just doing it to, you know, get by and pay the few bills you have. I haven't had an electric bill in three years, you know. So, I mean, my, my cost of living is way down. But, you know, I still have school loans to pay off. Um, uh, you know, I still have gas I need to put in the car every so often. And so there's things you still have to pay for and things you need. And uh, even p pioneers who lived 200 years ago, they were not completely self-sustainable. They still relied on trade and barter. They still relied on the general store and getting uh, trade and supplies shipped in, uh, either from the river or whatever, uh, flour and grains and things like that that they couldn't grow on their own, and sugar and salt, uh, those things that they had to go trade for. So uh, people say, how to be 100% self-sustainable? Uh, you can't do that. You can make a lot of the stuff on your own, but you're still going to have to rely on other people and being able to work with them to get what you need. And, and that's just part of being a community, whether you're, you're in a community like your, your in-laws live with you and you can sustain that relationship and, and work together to build something up. But you have to go outside of your homestead. And, you know, I, I think I've seen you do beekeeping and uh, milk trading uh, when you do raw milk. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how you, stay in that relationship with your surrounding neighbors and, and how you you leverage each other's skills. Right, and we help each other. So uh, within my valley here, there's a number of people that we work with on a regular basis or are continuing to work with on a regular basis. Uh, one of the guys, he raises bees and he just got a milk cow. There's another neighbor down the road who has a milk cow. We've been trading milk with her quite a bit and it's good milk. And um, and there's other people who have gardens and they have their own uh, certain skills, whether it be, you know, making lumber or uh, all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, you trade for that and then you work within your community and just people maybe even farther outside to go get manures. Uh, there's a, a rabbit farm not that far where we go get lots of manures from that rabbit farm and um, use that for our gardens. And there's a wood chip lumber yard not that far. We go get uh, wood chips for our garden that we put down. Uh, we use the back to, back to Eden garden method. And so, you know, there's just, you work within your community to get the things you need. And at the same time, try to produce as much as you possibly can to, you know, to limit that. Uh, but, you know, always be able to be ready to trade the things that you make. We take eggs. We get an abundance of eggs this time of year. And we're trading our eggs for different things. So, you know, that's, it, that, that process never stops. And you mentioned some of the products that you sell. I've got two of them in front of me. Guys, if you're interested in those, this is the Smoke Salt. Uh, it is delicious. You're going to get a review on that in just a few weeks. Uh, I obviously want to give it the fair uh, taste test uh, over the next few uh, weeks to, to try it out. I've had it in my lasagna. I had it in my eggs this morning. It was great. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description below where you can purchase that. And your newest product, tell us a little bit about this, is the beard oil. Now, there's no shortage of beard oil on the internet. So tell our viewers why your beard oil is outstanding. Yes, yeah, so check this out. We, I mean, we, I'm really happy about this product, and uh, I was really excited about it when uh, a couple came to me. Uh, she is very uh, versed on um, oils in general and essential oils. And you know, when you look at some of the beard oils that are on the market today, they say, "Oh, we got all these types of oils, blah blah blah," but they don't tell you exactly what oils are in the product hardly sometimes, and they don't tell you, you know, the amounts or stuff like that. But our there's six oils. That make up our beard oil, six oils, including two essential oils, and so uh, we, we're. I think that's phenomenal. Some of these beard oils that you find out there are going to be two or three, maybe tops, and um, and not six. So we really want the extra mile to put together a really good product based on some other recipes that people had given us with the things that they had made at home that they enjoyed. And here's the deal: when you if you want a good beard. Um, I tell people, listen, you got to put some oil because it gets dry, it cracks, it gets split ends. If you just put the oil on that, it'll, it'll really help uh, full it out and, and make it grow longer. And so there's a lot of people who uh, growing beards are in today and a lot of people who are discovering that oils will help uh, that beard look even better and uh, fuller. And so uh, that's why you see so many uh, beard oils on the market today. We wanted to just put out uh, something that uh, would be superior, even though we're not as big a name brand as some of these others. Um, but you know, people who watch us who do have beards, uh, they can get a good beard oil and see the benefits of that. Great. And that is again, the American homestead, uh, beard oil. I'll leave a, again, a link in description below. I've, I've used it for the last week and a half and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. So be on the lookout for a review on that in the next few weeks. 
Guys, being tactical for me, and I hope for you who are watching, is more than the military mindset. If you haven't had the experience that Zach and I have had in the military, and you're wondering what it's like to be remote working or being tactically uh, minded, please subscribe below. We're going to have more videos and more interviews just like this in the coming weeks, in the coming months, and I look forward to doing another review for An American Homestead in the coming weeks. Guys, thank you so much for checking out the interview today with An American Homestead. Again, all the links will be in the description. Please subscribe to An American Homestead and get all their videos in your feed today. Zach, thank you so much for coming on the channel. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.